Tom for the introduction. And in fact, if you do not like this presentation, all I can say is <laughs> thank you, Tom. Yes. This, this, this thing was actually entirely his fault. So, so he comes to me, um, it was the AXX event, I think, at U of T back in January. He says, hey, did you, did you want to come to the Waterloo Space Society and uh, do a talk? And I said, yeah, sure, no, I'm always up for that. And, uh, you know, what would you like me to talk about? He says, well, you know, can, can you talk about yourself? You know, some of the things you've done in the space industry. And I absolutely hate talking about myself. So this is all Tom's fault for making me do something I really don't want to do. But this is sort of a contract signed with blood or, or red pen or something, I suppose. So I'll talk only a little bit about myself. And I'll talk more, actually, on the other stuff, which I think is really much more interesting, which is ComDev and all the things that we're doing not too far from here that are having a very uh, significant impact and involvement in the overall Canadian space program. Now, how it actually got started, this is the bad talk about me part of it, how I actually got started, a lot of people say, you know, I was inspired by Mars or going to Mars or what, what have you. Uh, I actually took my first inspiration from a different planet, it was the blue one. Um, Probably most of us can identify that. That's Neptune. Neptune, yes, it was Neptune. So when I was in high school, uh, Voyager 2 flew by Neptune, and there was a bit of a media buzz. And I remember there was a National Geographic article about the mission a few uh, sort of few months after the flyby, and there were a lot there were a lot of cool stuff in in the article about the science about the moon Triton and the geysers of Triton and and the highly elliptical orbit of Nereid and and all that good stuff, but there was actually a little sidebar to that article that I found to be much more interesting than the science. And it was a sidebar about the mission operations team at JPL and all the things that they had to think about and plan and schedule in order to be able to execute the mission. And, I, and one of the examples that they cited, uh, this being a spacecraft that was launched in the 1970s, uh, you know, very primitive by our standards, that actually had a physical tape recorder to, uh, to store data. Uh, they didn't have solid state when this was launched. So whenever they spun up the tape recorder, because it's so dark in the outer solar system, they had very long exposure times. They had to keep the spacecraft very accurately pointed. And to mitigate, they needed to counteract any perturbation to that. So if they turned on the tape recorder, that was a perturbation. They needed to fire a thruster to dump the momentum and keep it steady. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever, that people were actually out there doing stuff like this, having to think about these little details in order to make these incredible missions happen. And I figured that, you know, I'd really like to be a part of doing something like that. I went to university, unfortunately not here. Uh, I went to University of Toronto and did the engineering science program there. Uh, probably the less said about that, the better, so I'll just, uh, I'll just skip the slide now. That's, that's, that any resemblance to me in that picture is entirely coincidental. And what is really cool about universities, uh, you know, here at Waterloo or Toronto or York or many others, is a lot of them are really getting directly involved in space projects directly in a big way. So I had the privilege at U of T for my undergrad thesis to work with Dr. Jim Drummond, who was at U of T at the time. He's actually a candidate chair at Dalhousie now, so he's kind of moved up in the world. And uh, at the time, he was developing an instrument called MOPIT, Measurements of Pollution in the Troposphere. And uh, sort of unwittingly, this was my first contact with ComDev, because ComDev was actually the prime contractor for, for the MOPIT instrument that eventually went up on this satellite, Terra EOS AM1. And uh, its purpose was to measure carbon monoxide levels in the, in the lower troposphere. I'll talk a little bit more about Moppet later, but that was sort of my first real involvement in, in an actual space mission. Did my master's at the uh, Institute, the UFT, Air Institute for Aerospace Studies, and possibly, well, I, I, there were two outcomes out of, out of my master's. The first was that I discovered I was completely inept at research and that this was not for me, and that there was no hope in hell that I was ever going to do a PhD. And the second lesson that I learned was some one of the bitter realities of the space business that I learned very quickly is that 
Cool things can come and cool things can be taken away from you very easily. So the master's project that I was doing was some modeling work for this. It was called DICE, Dynamics Identification and Control Experiment. It was a proposed payload that would have flown in the space shuttle mid-deck in order to do dynamics control and system identification experiments inside the space shuttle. Essentially, it was a mini satellite flying inside the confines of the space shuttle for which we could test uh, different attitude control algorithms. And we thought this was the really coolest thing. Uh, wrote my thesis, got all done, and uh, they canceled the project like, a couple of months after. So, so, so it never flew. But my involvement and uh, ComDev's involvement with uh, University of Toronto Aerospace Studies continues to this day. Uh, the top right there is actually one of our first satellite, NTS, nanosatellite tracking of ships. We have a strategic alliance with uh, Utias for development of uh, nanosat buses for our missions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and about NTS a bit later. Uh, first job out of university was uh, pretty weird. So I sort of put a resume in just kind of as a joke and I never expected a response from the people who were operating the RadarSat-1 spacecraft at the Canadian Space Agency. And it was just a lucky coincidence that I was doing orbit dynamics work as part of my master's studies, and they needed an orbit dynamic analyst for their ops team. So right after graduation, I ended up at the Space Agency in, uh, in San Diego, Quebec. Not as, a, not as a civil servant, it was, it was a contractor position. Uh, it was a small company called SCE, it's based out of Saskatoon. And one of the cool things that I got to be involved with uh, first was something called the Antarctic Mapping Mission. So up to that point, there had not been high resolution images of Antarctica taken from space. And RadarSat was able to achieve this as a synthetic aperture radar mission as opposed to an optical mission. It could uh, penetrate the clouds that normally shroud the southern polar region and took a lot of really one-of-kind images that are actually growing in importance uh, since they were taken because they're starting to serve as a baseline for things like uh, ice flux measurements you know, correlated to changes to, uh, to climate change. There was one other interesting thing I learned uh, during this was uh, one of the scientists from Ohio State came up and talked to us and he told us that in fact at that time they were declassifying some of the earliest American spy satellite images from the early 1960s was a project called Corona, uh, which was the first uh, American spy satellite. And they had actually taken pictures of Antarctica optically as well. Uh, I'm not sure why a spy satellite was taking pictures of Antarctica, but again, that was very interesting to establish a baseline for what the ice shells looked like in the early 1960s, and now we have data you know, from the 80s and 90s and, and today to see the trends with respect to the impact of climate change. <clears throat> I, uh, 